we are in the third series of a message series entitled, This Beautiful Mess. Ephesians 2.10 says that for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I do not feel like God's masterpiece or workmanship. I feel like a big messy plate of spaghetti that's spilt on the floor. Anybody else felt like that or just life where you think you got a hold of it and then something happens and that whole plate just reaches that fulcrum point and the whole thing just slides off onto the floor. And sometimes that's what it feels like my life is. And I'm not just talking about the missing the daily appointments or running late or the messiness of the home, but oftentimes when I think about who I am, And where I should be, I feel like I am anything but God's workmanship. However, this calls in stark contrast what the Word of God says. Because oftentimes the way I feel and the way I view myself is in direct opposition to what the Word of God says about me. He says I am His workmanship, even though I can't see it. We need to understand first and foremost that what God says about us should be the foundation of what we say about ourselves. How God views us should be the foundation and the platform that we stand upon, not how we feel about our situation. Feelings are a horrible master. They will drive you from this way, that way, and the other. Because feelings are always changing. Feelings should never drive our faith. Faith should always drive our feelings. I don't care how you feel, live in faith. I don't care how I feel. I mean, I do, and I care about how you feel. However, it's only a part of the equation. It's not the deciding factor. And we should stop treating our feelings as the deciding factor. Stop giving your feelings more power and authority than they should have in your life. That's what this series is all about. We are looking at the lives of men and women uh, actually outside of the Bible throughout history, church history, because there are some very interesting people who have lived interesting lives. And some are the worst of humanity, and God does something amazing through their life and turns their life into a masterpiece. No matter where you are at today, no matter how you feel today, know this, that your life is a masterpiece in the hands of the artist. Your life is a masterpiece in the hands of the master sculptor. And he is crafting and fashioning a masterpiece out of your life. Turn to your neighbor and say, back up, I'm a masterpiece. first week, I talked about a man by the name of Martin Luther, a very over-the-top, in-your-face, disliked man, and God uses all of his faults, all of his quirks, all of his failings in order to do something great for the kingdom. We also learned last week about a man named John Newton, a man who was vile and vicious, who was actively involved in slave trade, and he uses this man to pin the seminal song, Amazing Grace. Nobody is beyond the grace of God, and he uses the life of John Newton to teach us this. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26 says this, then Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, And follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Today, the title of my message is The Playboy. And let me tell you this that this message is a call to arms. It is a rally cry for anybody who desires to be rescued from an ordinary life. 
Anybody who desires not just to mark time and check off days until you are put into the ground, but somebody who wants to make their life count for something. Is there anybody in this room who wants your life to count for something? Well, if that's you, this is your rally cry. This is your rally cry. This is your moment. This is your morning. Because God has called you out of an ordinary life. He wants more for you. But in order to achieve this, you've got to lay it down. It's not about you. It's about his kingdom. It's not about me. It's about him. The playboy. Who am I talking about today? It is somebody that you've probably never heard of. Go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 19. And while you are turning there, let me... Let me introduce this person. I'm going to tell you about a man by the name of Thomas Beckett. You've probably, like I said, have never heard of Thomas Beckett. But let me tell you about Thomas Beckett. This is one of my favorite stories. There's just something about it that that just resonates, I guess. Thomas Beckett was born in England in 20. His parents were nobles and merchants. So he has money, he has authority, he has influence in early England. Thomas was the very definition of a playboy or a consummate bachelor or that old phrase, a man about town or a newer phrase, a party animal. Whatever phrase that you want to use, he was the consummate frat boy. Thomas Beckett enjoyed the company of women, a lot of them. He enjoyed fast horses, oftentimes racing throughout the streets of London. He enjoyed loud, ostentatious carriages. He enjoyed brightly colored, ostentatious clothing that would get any kind of attention that he needed. He was that kind of guy living that quote-unquote glamorous, fast-paced party lifestyle. This was Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett was a heavy drinker who spent many a night carousing, drinking, and running amok. He was also big into uh, hunting. He loved to hunt. And it was during one of these many hunting expeditions that he met a man by the name of Henry. Not just any Henry, but Henry II, the king of England. And he became close and fast friends with Henry II because Henry II was also a man about town. He also loved a good party. He loved the company of women. He loved drinking and he loved hunting. So these two men struck up a strong friendship. And were often seen throughout London causing a scene. Living a very, very wild lifestyle. But one thing we need to understand is at this time, there is a big struggle between the Catholic Church and the the King of England as to who really is the real authority in England. Is it the King or is it the Catholic Church? So there's this constant power struggle about who's really making the decisions. So during this time, there's a vacancy in the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is essentially the head of the church in England. And Henry II, he gets this idea. He says, I'm not going to wait for Rome to send somebody up here. I'm going to appoint my own Archbishop of Canterbury, and I'm going to appoint somebody that I can trust. I'm going to appoint somebody that has a similar viewpoint on life as I do. So when it comes time for me to make decisions, and it comes time to involve the church, I know I've got an inside guy who likes carousing, who likes partying, who likes all these things, and I won't have any trouble with the church. So he goes to his good friend, Thomas Beckett, and he says, I'm going to make you the Archbishop of Canterbury. You're going to be uh, one of the most powerful men in England. You're going to be over the whole church in England. And Thomas Beckett looks at him and smiles and says, no, thank you. 
No, that's not for me. Yeah, it's for you. You're my guy. You're, you are my bro. You're my bro. Yeah, you know. He says, no, you don't want to do this. Trust me. This will not be good. And he refuses again. But Henry II is not hearing any of it. So he goes ahead and he appoints Thomas Beckett as the Archbishop of Canterbury. This is a decision that changes the trajectory of both of their lives. And it changes the trajectory of the church in England. And what happens, it's an amazing thing that happens. Thomas Beckett, who had very little real uh, experience in the church, he grew up in the church because that's what the nobility did, but as far as really understanding who Jesus is, he had very little exposure. So this is the guy now who's the head of the church. Smart move, right? But he jumps into this and he is revolutionized by Jesus Christ. He is changed completely as he studies, as he learns about who Jesus is, as he reads about what Jesus did, as he truly absorbs and understands who this amazing person is. Who is Jesus? He's completely transformed. Let me encourage you with this. When you truly see Jesus for who he is, you will be transformed. You will be transformed. I remember as a young man by the age of 14, I'd grown up in church and cut my teeth on the pews. I'd brought bags of Legos and Ninja Turtles and whatever to play in the church. You know, I I used to sneak uh, communion crackers and and extra uh, communion uh, drinks because I was thirsty and I'd I'd take two or three of them, you know, as a kid. I grew up in church, but at the age of 14, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in my life, and I became uh, transfixed with this question, who is Jesus? And that question has altered the trajectory and the course of my life, and I am still answering that question in my life today. Who is Jesus to me today? And it is a question that will get inside of you. And I encourage you to let that question just find a purchase in your heart. Find a place in your life because it will change you forever. This is a call to everyone who is tired of being a spectator to the game of their very own life. God is calling you to more. And it begins with the question, who is Jesus? We'll get back to Thomas Beckett in a moment and Henry II and their relationship. But I want to draw some connections. Are y'all still with me? I want to draw some connections from Thomas Beckett to another man who is found in Scripture, and he's found in Matthew chapter 19. Now, this is another young man of wealth, and influence. You can read, it doesn't give a ton of information about the man, but from what we gather, he's actually not a playboy. He's not a man about town. But he is a young man of wealth and influence, and he has an encounter with Jesus. And unfortunately, where Thomas Beckett's encounter with Jesus changes him and changes the trajectory of his life, This man walks away from Jesus. And as we read this, we cannot help but ask ourselves, why? What is it that doesn't stick? What is it that causes him or allows him to turn away from the Son of God? From the divine creator of the universe? What is it that causes him to walk away? Matthew 19, 20, or 16 through 26 says this, And behold, a man came to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to obtain eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. 
if you would enter life, then keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it is important, the, the actual commandments that he gives, there's a reason for it, and it's important. We keep that in your mind. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, then go, sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to the disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Let us pray today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it it is alive. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that your word changes us from the inside out. And as we open up and unpack your word, I pray that our hearts would be receptive soil, that your word could take root and change us. I pray that we would open our minds and just move in accordance with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would open up the windows of heaven to bless us this week, protect us, guide us. And I pray that we would Leave this place looking more like, acting more like, loving more like your son Jesus than we did when we came in here. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We talk about this rich young ruler. See a surface reading of this encounter with Jesus and the rich young ruler. If you just read it and, and don't really look at it and study it, you would think the Bible is saying that money is bad. That is not what the Word of God is saying here. Money, please understand this, money is neither good nor bad. Money is just a necessary part of humanity. Every single civilization and society that has ever existed has utilized some form of uh, monetization in order for the trade of, of goods and services. It's necessary. It's neither good nor bad. When you love money more than you love God, then it becomes bad. Like the Word of God says that he, is, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's neither good nor bad, it just is. But there's something deeper that's going on in this young man's heart. Something more than just the love of money. It goes as deep as his self his personhood, who he is. The rich young ruler falls into the trap that more and more and more people today fall into. The rich young ruler is all about himself. He's all about self. He's all about mine. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to do me. I'm going to do my thing. Just watch out. Step back. Let me live my life. I'm going to live my best life. I'm going to live out my truth because it's all about the rich young ruler. The Word of God says that if we want to follow him, we must deny ourselves. See, we have a, we have a world and a culture that's denying the Word of God because we, do, we don't want to deny ourselves. The Word of God says that I shouldn't do this or live this way, but I want to live this way. So the word of God must be wrong. Because, and how many have heard this one? God surely wants me to be happy. No, he doesn't. He wants you to be fruitful. And happiness comes from fruitfulness. And fruitfulness comes from obedience to his word. Listen, I've come, you've heard me talk about this, but I've come to the realization that healthiness is, ha is better than happiness. Because if I wanted to be happy, I would eat chocolate chip cookies every night. Amen. Amen, that's right. My love language is tacos. 
But eating tacos every night and chocolate chip cookies and milkshakes and all of these things does not a healthy mark make. It makes for a happy mark, but not a healthy mark. And if I want my kids to enjoy a healthy mark when they have kids, so those two are in contrast to each other. Those two oppose each other. They are enemies to each other at times, my happiness and my health. The happiness and the fruitfulness of my life are at times enemies to each other. And one has to win and one has to lose. Which one is it going to be? Your happiness or your fruitfulness? And we have an epidemic happening in our churches and in our homes all across America. People are turning away from faith. They're turning away from God. Why? Because their happiness is the Lord of their life. I want to be happy. And the Word of God says, that, listen, if we obey the Word of God, you'll be happy. But you've got to align yourself with Scripture. And this is what's happening with the rich young ruler. It's all about him. In fact, the first thing we know is that the rich young ruler refuses to see beyond himself. He refuses to look beyond the own scope of his life. For him, his faith begins and ends with himself. What must I do so that I can obtain eternal life? Galatians 2.20 says, For I am, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. It's not I, but Christ that lives within me. And we read earlier, anyone who desires to come after me should deny themselves and pick up their cross. Pick up their cross? What are we talking about? Let me switch it up to give it a little, give you a little uh, modern context of what we're talking about, okay? Because when it's, Jesus says, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, let me change that out. I'm going to remove cross because for many of us that means a little pendant that we hang around our neck. What Jesus is saying is anybody who wants to follow me must deny themselves, pick up their dose of lethal injection and follow me. That is the preferred form of capital punishment in our country today, death by lethal injection. In the Roman Empire, the preferred form of capital punishment to death was a cross. Let me jump back a few decades, must deny themselves grab their electric chair and follow me. When Jesus is saying this, he's talking about a widely accepted instrument of death. It's kind of morbid, don't you think? But what he's talking about is that you've got to deny yourself. You've got to be willing to lay your life down. We've got to be willing to lay our lives down. And this is what the rich young ruler refuses to do. In fact, he makes it all about himself. Anybody know that person? Anybody got that family member who makes it all about themselves? Anybody? Come on, raise your hands. It's okay if you've got that. If you're not raising your hand, it may be you. Watch out. You know what I'm talking about? You have an emergency and you end up taking your, you know, family member or kid or something to the, to the emergency room and you're just you're just making one decision after the next. You know, it's, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just making this. I, I'm dealing with this right now. I'm dealing, you know. And of course, you know, word gets out. And then you got that aunt or whomever that calls you up. I'm like, well, thanks for telling me. You, could you have picked up a phone and called me? No, I couldn't have. I was dealing with my kid, you know. But thank you for making it all about you. I'm so sorry. Next time, I'll make sure I put it on your agenda so that you know when I'm having a life emergency. But that's what we do, though. We make it all about ourselves. When something happens, it's how, that, how does that affect me? When this happens, how does that affect me? I mean, let's get real in the American church. I mean, let's, we've got beautiful churches that line our states and our cities and our nations. And, and we get upset when the air conditioning is a little too hot or a little too cold. What was with church today? That had to have been 67 degrees in there today. I can't worship God in 67 degrees. 
at 73 today. Oh, 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 sweating through my clothes. I can't worship God in 73 degrees. I just came back from Zambia where there are no air conditioners in any churches ever. 90 degrees we could worship God. Because it's not about us, it's about Him. But the rich young ruler refuses to do this. Second thing he does is he, he refuses to see beyond himself, but he refuses also to reach beyond himself. You see, when pressed, the rich young ruler refuses to stretch. Jesus lists commandments. What must I do? He says, obey the commandments. Oh yeah, which ones? Duh, all of them. That's why they're all there. But he wants to know which ones. And what he's saying to Jesus, what he's implying, if you read between the lines, is which ones can I get away with breaking? How close to breaking the law can I get without breaking the law? All right? Come on, you know, listen, come on, let's get real because we all live with two speed limits. The spoken speed limit, 55. And the unspoken speed limit, the speed limit that we feel comfortable going over the given speed limit to which we think cops won't pull us over. For some of us, it's four. It always seems to go in increments of five. I don't know. If you go four miles over, it's good. My brother used to say, nine, you're fine, ten, you're mine. So you can go nine miles over, but if you go ten, the cops say he's mine, right? How close can I get? without actually breaking. You see, he doesn't mention, though, he gives the, the commandments, but he doesn't mention any of the keep the Sabbath and, and do not take the Lord's name in vain. He does not give any of the commandments. Did you notice that? The commandments that deal directly with God. He only gives the commandments that directly deal with each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal honor your father and mother. Think, he gives those type of commandments. And he says, oh yeah, yeah, I've done those things. Got them. What else can I do? What else can I do? I believe this because this was a rich young ruler who's, who's a devout man. He went to church. He loved the Lord, but he didn't love other people. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 1 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I, have nothing more, I am nothing more than a clanging gong or a clamoring cymbal. I could prophesy, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. Our churches are filled. We have too many churches filled with people who don't truly love people. They say they love God. But truly what's happening, listen, we have an epidemic of churches that uh, filled with people who don't truly love other people, they're not truly serving God, they've become connoisseurs of church culture. Connoisseurs of church culture. I just got, listen, I just got back from a trip with multiple pastors, and my daughter can attest to this. One of them was a connoisseur of church culture. That's all he talked about constantly this preacher preaches this way and this person I mean constant talking about church and and you would think uh, upon you know initial meaning oh he's so close to God he's so holy oh he was a connoisseur of church culture because he was the rudest out of any person in our group to anybody we don't need, I'm, I'm tired of churches being filled with people who are connoisseurs of church culture, but don't want to love their neighbors and love people. Not everybody's going to think like you think. Not everybody's going to look like you look. Not everybody's going to agree with you, but we love them anyway. Agreement is not a prerequisite to love. God is, this is a call. This is a call. For a deep, to a deeper kind of commitment, a deeper kind of church experience, to where we get away from just being connoisseurs of church culture. But we get into the deep things of truly loving people. And you know our nation is divided. 
And it is easy for us to look at people who believe differently, who say things differently, who may look differently, who may be at a different part of the country, and it's easy to be filled with frustration and anger and bitterness, but that is not what God has called us to. We are to be filled with love. And guess what? They don't have to agree with us in order for us to love them. We love them anyway. This is a rally cry to a deeper kind of impact in our city. Let me ask this question. When was the last time you let yourself be stretched by the Spirit of God? There's a book entitled Leadership Pain, and it it states simply that as a leader, you will only grow to the level of your pain threshold. When was the last time we allowed ourselves to be stretched by God? Are we too busy being comfortable? Sitting in our comfortable services, watching our comfortable preachers? You know, because this is, hey, if if y'all want, I mean, I mean, there's some pretty, you know, over the top preachers. I could be over the top. I can, woo, I could, we could do that. I get up here and I can juggle flaming poodles, whatever you want me entertaining, ah, you know. We turn this thing into a circuit, but it's not going to change anybody's lives. It's the word of God that changes people's lives. And we cannot be changed unless we're allowed to be, we allow ourselves to be challenged. Question number two I want to ask you. When was the last time that you, you gave until it hurt? When was the last time you gave until it hurt? We, we are looking to make impact in our city and in our world. Jody talked about it, our legacy initiative updating these facilities so that we can reach more people. That's what it's all about. Listen, I don't want to update our facilities just so we can say, look at those amazing chairs we got. Aren't we great? No, I want to update it because it's a nice comfy chair that we can put more people in so they can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what it's all about. We're looking to impact the nation of Mozambique, building churches. I just got back From the nation of Zambia, they are wanting to build 250, plant 250 churches in the next five years. And here's the problem that they've run into. The majority of their churches, they had a partnership with the government to where the churches were uh, housed in the schools. And when COVID hit, that all shut down. And then when everything started to open back up, the school said, I'm sorry, we don't want you back. So out of 141 churches, now hear this, 141 churches for the entire nation of Zambia that are assembly of God. We have more than that in Oklahoma City. Okay? Out of 141 churches, there are maybe 20 churches that have land and some kind of a building on them. The majority of the churches in Zambia were in schools and they've been all kicked out of their meeting spaces. There is need. And I was talking with the area director over all of Southern Africa about the need in Zambia and I talked about our heart to reach Mozambique, and he said, oh, we need tabs in Mozambique as well. All southern Africa is in desperate need of churches. And I just, call me crazy, I just, that kind of got me excited, because I know that's something that God has put on our heart, to build churches in that area. For years and years, we built churches in Malawi, which is a sister nation to Mozambique and Zambia, but that whole region is in need of churches. You know what region also is in need? Oklahoma City. When was the last time you gave until it hurt? I encourage you, between now and the end of the year, give until it hurts. Give. Generosity. When was the last time you served because you were needed? When was the last time you were served Because you are needed. Our church is growing and it is moving. And we need people to help. Let me give you an example. Okay, let me, let me, this is a challenge. This is a hard word, okay? I don't want you to think I'm talking down about our discipleship classes. You know I love our discipleship classes. We are in need of people on our host team right now. Desperate need. Pastor Adam, do we need people on our host team? Yes, we do. Once a month, serve once a month to greet new people. The answer that we get from a lot of people that we ask to serve is, I can't. 
is I don't want to miss the last 10 minutes of my discipleship class once a month. So we're not serving because we don't want to miss 10 minutes of discipleship class one time a month. We need to be challenged. We need to be challenged to serve. We need to be challenged to serve. First and foremost, our classes go from 9 to 10 a.m. So they should be ending at 10. If they're going to 10, 15, 10, 20, then teachers, you're going too long. Now, come on. Don't overcook my grits. But we got more and more new faces, new people coming to our church, and we need to have friendly faces to greet those new faces. To let them know they're welcome because they are. When challenged, the rich young ruler walks away. When he's challenged, he walks away. Don't walk away. God is challenging us. He's challenging you to live a life. Let me talk personally. I talked about a lot of church stuff for the last just couple minutes, but God is calling you. He's, he has dreams. He has visions for you to make an impact bigger than your own self. To make an impact bigger than you. I got to say, <clears throat> this is, I just feel like I need to say it. Ron, where are you at? Ron Hop. He's back there somewhere. Okay. Ron Hop, 30 years ago, got led on his heart to go to the nation of Mozambique. And Ron Hop personally built through, and a lot of people helped him with this, so it was true, but but was led by the Lord to build uh, resource centers and missionary centers, mission centers in the nation of Mozambique before we as a church ever got to there. This was not a church thing. This was not an assembly God thing. This was a personal thing that God led Ron to do, and he was obedient, and he's made an impact in the city of Tet in Mozambique because he followed God. And God has an impact he wants you to make. He wants to rescue you from an ordinary life. He wants to rescue you from just living your days and, and just watch your TV, go watch Netflix till Jesus comes. There's more to do than that. And you and I get to be a part of God's kingdom. So Thomas Beckett is transfixed and changed by Jesus. He begins reaching out to the poor and the destitute. He becomes the bishop of the people. Henry II soon starts calling in favors from Thomas Beckett. I need your help with this. I need you to compromise here. I need you to compromise there. You're my guy. You're my frat boy. You're my, you're my, you're my boy. I need your help. Thomas Beckett refuses. This keeps happening. Thomas Beckett continues to refuse because he's changed now. And Thomas Beckett and Henry II, who were once great friends, now become enemies. Henry begins to hate Thomas Beckett and soon regrets appointing Thomas Beckett as the archbishop to the point to where Thomas Beckett has to actually flee to the nation of France and live there for a year in hiding from Henry II. He returns And he stands up to the king once again, and in exasperation, the king says this. He says, is there no one in England who can rid me of this troublesome priest? And four of the king's knights hear this, and they grab their swords, and they grab their horses, and they head to the cathedral at Canterbury. And the other priests and the monks there see the knights coming, and they bar the doors to protect Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett then scolds the priests and he opens the doors and he tells them a house, the the church, the house of God should never be closed to anyone who might need prayer. And he opens the doors and the knights come in and they surround Thomas Beckett and they, they try to take him to see the king, to answer for what he's done. Thomas Beckett refuses to go because of the people who need him. And there at the altar of the Cathedral of Canterbury, those knights pull their swords and they kill Thomas Beckett. And this starts, while it's never called that, but a reform in the Church of England. 
and it paves the way for another Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Augustine, who comes many, many years later. Thomas Beckett, the playboy, who lived for nothing but himself, is so transfixed with who Jesus is that he gives up his life to be martyred, to be killed for the cause of Christ. This is all to all who would answer. Are you ready to live for something more? Are you ready to give until it hurts? Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to fight for your family? Are you ready to fight for your marriage? Are you ready to fight for your children? Are you ready to fight for your city? Are you ready to fight for this church? Are you ready to fight for other people? Are you ready to look beyond yourself? And are you ready to reach beyond yourself? Are you ready to see lives changed? It's going to take more than just a passing interest in living for Him. It's going to take, and it's going to take dedication. I'm not asking you, hear this, I'm not asking you to be brave enough to die for Jesus. I'm asking you to be brave enough to live for Him. Because let's get real, I'd be crazy to, for you to ask you to give your life. Let's start with this. I ask you to give him a second thought. Because so often what happens, you get challenged by a message like this, and then we leave and we don't even give it a second thought until we come in next Sunday. We say, oh yeah, what was preacher talking about last week? I don't know. Oh well. Let's start there. Let's give it a second thought. There's more. God is calling you. He wants to rescue you from an ordinary life. And it starts with looking beyond ourselves. If we want to follow him, we must pick up our cross. I'm crucified with Christ, but yet I live as I lay my life down, as I lay my own personal selfish desires down. Somehow, some way, a miracle happens in my life that I get a greater and more beneficial life, a a fuller and more glorious life, a John 10, 10 life. As I lay down what I want, God fills that with what he wants, and it's greater than what I wanted in the first place. Are you ready? Are you ready? If everybody would stand to your feet. As you do, I just want to say this. We have altars here. We've got big square altars for families to come because we believe in prayer. You can gather around and kind of huddle around and pray. At the family altar, we have regular altars. If you have a hard time with your knees, in the back we have standing altars. It's a little different, but for our family members who have back problems, knee problems, you can stand at a standing altar and take that position of prayer. There's nothing magical, there's nothing sacred or, or you know, about an altar, the, the specific, the wood, or the, it's just materials, but there is something sacred about making that movement to where I'm going to make a physical movement and I'm going to dedicate a place to where I'm going to get along with God and let God speak to me. There's something about it. Many of you know you could work out at home, but there's something about going to a gym, isn't there? To a place that's dedicated to building up your muscles. There's something about making that motion. I get in the car, I get dressed, I prepare myself to build up and strengthen myself. That's what altars are. I'm going to move, make a physical movement, and dedicate myself to building up my faith. We're going to open up these altars. I encourage everyone to come spend some time in prayer. The worship band is going to to play for us and lead us in some more worship before we dismiss. Before I open up these altars, I want everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. I've got to ask this. We're talking about being rescued from an ordinary life. We're talking about living for something more than yourself. For some of you in this place. You need to give your life over to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. Stop living for yourself. Start living for Him. He has an abundant life. John 10, 10 says, For I've come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. It also says, the Word of God says, that no man comes to the Father unless through me. You cannot earn your way to heaven like the rich young ruler tried to do. You can't buy your way. See, with man it is impossible, but with God... Anything is possible. Are you in this place? 
and you recognize your need for him as the Lord and Savior of your life, if that is you, would you simply slip up your hand that I can lead you in a prayer today? Is there anybody in this place? Yes, anybody else? Yes, I see hands. Yes. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. For those of you who raise your hands, this is your prayer. This is your moment. This is your time. You are crossing the line of faith right now. You are entering into a new relationship and a new journey that's going to last you the rest of your life. For those who have already prayed this prayer, we are repeating this prayer as a sign of solidarity to remember within ourselves and to be a family to those who are raising their hands. If you would bow your head and uh, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to live a perfect life and to die on the cross but to be risen after three days in all glory to be the sacrifice for my sins I accept that I've messed up I need your love and grace I believe that you are the Savior and I confess that you are the Lord of my life so come into my heart and make me yours Jesus name. Amen. I'm going to open up these altars and I am calling everybody who would come down and find a place to pray. Find a place to pray and let's dedicate ourselves to being rescued from an ordinary life. Let's dedicate ourselves to sell out to something bigger than just ourselves. Let's dedicate ourselves to living for God. Come on, if you would, come. Let's find a place to pray. Let's engage the Holy Spirit. Let's encounter God. And let's commit to do something big for Him for the next few moments. Would you come and pray?